Hello, everyone, and welcome to this LinkedIn Live uh, event brought to you by MIT Sloan Executive Education, uh, where I'm delighted today to be joined by two of our stellar colleagues, Dr. Phil Budden and Professor Fiona Murray. Uh, Phil and Fiona will be uh, presenting to us today uh, some of their most recent work uh, on the topic of accelerating corporate innovation uh, in a post-COVID COVID world. Very exciting for us to be looking at the prospect of this being a post-COVID world. Uh, of course, we're still very much uh, around the world in the throes of it as well. And uh, to that note, it would be great in the chat and comments if you could share with us uh, where in the world you're joining us uh, from. It's very interesting for us to see we, we generally have a, such a global audience. So please do share that and it'll just uh, get you going with posting some things in the comments where we encourage you uh, as this presentation and discussion continues to share your thoughts uh, and questions. So we're, we're being joined again uh, by Phil Budden and Fiona Murray. Uh, Fiona uh, is a professor at the MIT Sloan School. She is also the Associate Dean for Innovation and Inclusion uh, at the MIT Sloan School, the William Porter Professor of Entrepreneurship and, and an Associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research and the Co-Director of the MIT's Innovation Initiative. Uh, just those are just a few of the really extensive array of responsibilities that Fiona has and makes uh, to uh, to MIT, including being a very uh, leading researcher uh, uh, in the field uh, of innovation. Uh, uh, and uh, she'll be sharing some of that uh, insight and that work with us, I think, uh, in today's comments. Uh, and Fiona is uh, joined by uh, our colleague uh, Phil Budden, who is a senior lecturer. Uh, also at the MIT Sloan School of Management in the Technology, Innovation, Entrepreneurship and Strategic Management uh, Group. Phil focuses on innovation-driven entrepreneurship and innovation ecosystems. Uh, and in addition to uh, his academic background uh, as a historian originally, uh, Phil brings enormous uh, experience as a public servant for the UK government uh, and uh, particularly in the field of, of diplomacy. And we got to know Phil when he was the Consul General uh, for the British government uh, in, in our backyard uh, at, at, near MIT for New England. Uh, and he's been contributing and sh uh, researching uh, in collaboration with Fiona now for several years and teaching in a variety of exec ed programs as well. I think we're going to hear a bit about all of those things. Uh, but for now, let me get out of the way. Uh, I, I would like to hand over to Phil and to Fiona, but I will be helping monitor the comments and chat. And I'll come back in a little bit to help uh, put some of your questions and comments to Phil and Fiona uh, as this uh, session goes on. So thanks again for joining us. Thank you, uh, Phil and Fiona, for being here. And let me hand it over to you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Peter. And Fiona said I should go first uh, after Peter. So I've just been monitoring the locations. Uh, thank goodness I am a diplomat, Fiona. We have people from around the world. So uh, Good, good day, guten tag, bienvenidos, assalamu alaikum. This really is a global audience who's patched in today. Uh, so as Peter kindly said, and Peter, thank you for all you do, keeping exec ed uh, on the road despite the, uh, the challenges of the pandemic. And I'm delighted to be joining you as a senior lecturer today, um, as a recovering diplomat and executive myself, and in partnership as ever with Professor Fiona Murray. Um, Fiona, it's a pleasure to get to work with you. Um, perhaps you'd like to say a few words of, of welcome. Yes, I just, um, let me add my thanks. Uh, I want to thank Peter for um, organizing this for us. And I um, want to thank you, Phil, for, um, you know, really having the brave idea that we would try yet another new technology platform. Uh, any of our former students and colleagues out there will know that new technology is not always my favorite thing, um, but it's always great to try new ways of connecting. And connecting we are, because I'm seeing people from literally, some people, you know, from Waltham, Mass, or just around down the road from us, um, to people who are in many, many time zones. Some of you clearly can't sleep um, and so really it's it's delightful to have a chance to be here with you today um, there's a lot for us to talk about I think today because as Peter said we are I hope and I think we all hope and pray emerging from uh, into a post-pandemic world uh, we're not there yet 
And I know many of you will still be in places in the world where this is hugely challenging um, and where you know, all of us have faced all sorts of hardships and, and difficulties. Uh, but as we start to think, look forward and as leaders of large organizations, uh, corporate uh, leaders and leaders in the public as well as the private sector, you know, there's a lot we need to talk about. And particularly when we talk about innovation. Innovation has been very important in, I think, bringing us through much of this uh, a crisis and obviously innovation very specifically in things like uh, vaccines and, and supply chains, but also much more broadly. And innovation is often the way in which we emerge from um, economic crises. And we know that from past economic crisis. But there's a lot of things that we have to think about and talk about, particularly for those of us uh, like Phil and myself who think a lot about and try to understand the role of innovation ecosystems, those very special places on the planet where innovation happens, and trying to sort of ask the question, you know, what is what is the future for that? Is geography and place going to still matter in this post-pandemic world when we've all been online for so long? And I think many of us are enthusiastic to get off as well as stay on and have a more of a hybrid existence. So Phil, I think our agenda for today is to talk about a little bit about our approach to innovation, our approach to mm -hmm. ecosystems, and then kind of bring them together and say what next in this post-pandemic world. Does that does that sound right to you? That that sounds like a great way to to do it. And thank you for those uh, opening remarks. Uh, we have colleagues from around the world here, some of whom still facing uh, challenges. So as Fiona says, not all of us are coming out of the pandemic yet and travel hasn't returned, but we sense it coming. And that's why I was so keen uh, to encourage Fiona to take a chance on this LinkedIn Live technology. And those who know me know my, my love of technology. Um, to try and get some of these thoughts out in a live context, because we, I think we're at a really important moment, and we've been teaching this in a variety of different uh, ways, But and Fiona's been leading a lot of this uh, work, including her work on diversity and inclusion, and it just struck me that now is a good time to get that out here. But we'll, we'll start off uh, with our slides, um, talking a little bit about our approach to innovation and therefore ecosystems, because that shapes what we're then gonna spend most of our time talking about, which is the um, what's going to happen in this post-COVID world. So uh, with that, um, should we call up the slides and then we can start talking about what we're going to do here. So we start off as ever with a picture of um, ourselves uh, back when we used to wear ties and get dressed up. But um, innovation, what I'd like you to do, and you've demonstrated you can use chat, is to type in what innovation means to you. And now I just want to reassure you, there's no right or wrong answer. Um, we here at MIT have our definition, and we will share that with you shortly. Some of you may know this already, so don't give the game away. Um, but it's really helped for us to think through what is this innovation thing? Because defining it and coming up with a working definition is really important for taking this forwards. So um, I will keep an eye on the chat as things start to come in. Um, and then we will share with you the MIT definition, which Fiona created uh, by working through the MIT definition. So we got some solving current day problems, so incremental, a process, doing something new with what you've got, new creation. Excellent, keep, keep them coming. There is no right or wrong answer, new trend, progress. I'm not sure I agree with you, Phil. You know that we disagree. I think that there are some better answers as, as um, well as some less great answers, but that's okay. I'm going to, we're going to share our version of these things. I've been a professor yes. too long, so. <laughs> yes, as you'll notice, I'm the diplomat and don't want anybody to feel bad. Fiona is a professor, so has high standards. Um, mm -hmm. Innovations, a new idea, day-to-day -day tasks, way to solve a problem, creating value. Great suggestions out, out there, including from some friends of ours whom I, I recognize. Hello hello to, to Halifax, Nova Scotia, and also the Middle East. Um, excellent. Please keep your suggestions coming. Uh, really interesting. I don't see the tech word being mentioned there. So, Fiona, would you like to introduce us to the MIT working definition of, of, uh, of innovation? Yeah, I would be happy to. And so here it is. I just want to check that you can see that on your screen. Uh, so here's how we think about it at MIT. Uh, we think about innovation as the process of taking ideas from inception to impact. And so notice that this is a process definition. We haven't focused on a very specific technology, um, you know, a particular business model. We really are understanding that entire process of taking ideas from inception, the earliest moments, all the way through to impact. 
Now I'm going to start at the end of that and say, look, we're going to be interested on, in impact, which is really broader than simply profit. The reason we wanted to have that as part of our definition is because as you think about starting any given innovation project, uh, as you're building up a portfolio of innovation projects that are going to really lead your innovation strategy, you get to decide what impact means for you. And you get to define that for your organization, for your team, and for the individuals working uh, on those projects. And so that may be uh, profitability. It may be um, growth targets. Uh, it may be customer acquisition targets. But it can also include social impact. It can include environmental impact. And it can include a basket of those things because we simultaneously want to do something that is profitable in a way that makes that project sustainable, but also has these other uh, benefits. And so impact, I think, is an important word and one that allows for leadership and definition. I want to go back to the beginning, though, which is to emphasize that an idea is really a match between a problem and a solution. So it is about matching the particular problem, mission, or challenge that we might have uh, with the potential solution and sort of taking that forward on this journey. And so it's not just about technology and it's not just about solutions. It's about the match between problems and solutions. In the business world, we typically call this product market fit, but I think it's quite useful to step back and generalize because it allows us to think about sort of problem solution matching. Uh, and that gives us a richer sense and a richer context of what we're talking about. As I've already said, we focus on the process, not just products and services, um, because we want to think about the entire journey uh, from inception to impact. So that means that we're talking more than more than just about eureka moments or just about invention. Uh, we're talking about that entire journey that's going to include, um, you know, something conceptual. We're getting something on paper to something that is, you know, roughed out in code, uh, you know, that can be scaled. This can be in hardware or software. It can be tangible or intangible. But there is an entire journey. And if we do that, we recognize that there's going to be many different types of talent and expertise, diverse people with different skills, and that there are going to be different kinds of organizations optimized for different parts of that journey, that it could be startups, large corporations, nonprofits, governments, and universities. And so, again, that reminds us there are going to be some really tricky handoffs between different parts of our organization, different organizations. But so our definition is quite encompassing, but I hope it helps you just sort of think through rather than just the buzzword. Phil. That's excellent. Thank you so much for that introduction to innovation. Uh, you can only imagine the hard work that Fiona had to put in uh, getting MIT full of professors to agree on a definition of, of innovation. And we've uh, put in at the bottom there, for those who can't sleep, uh, a, a short working paper that we've done that sort of builds on this. One of the key things for me, having worked on innovation from a government and an executive side for the last 20 years, is the world technology is not in there, even though we're an institute of technology. And so I'm so glad to see the executive responses from so many people out there that it's not leading with technology. It's about all the other various aspects. Um, and I think that's the key part. And that it happens in various places, including corporations. And that's why we're doing this as corporate innovation. So if we turn now to the next slide, one of the big challenges was problems driven or solution driven, and there were innovation wars. Uh, in fact, Fiona, academics disagreed on whether it was tech pull, tech push. Would you like to tell us a bit about uh, those particular innovation wars and our approach to that? Yeah, so among academics, there were these, as I say, I've, I've dubbed them innovation wars because I think um, there was a lot of discussion about whether we needed technology push, sort of push ideas into the funnel, if you like, or whether we needed market pull and which one was best. Uh, to frame that slightly differently, should we be starting in problem space where we say, all right, let us define the problem that we want to solve and then explore solution space very widely to develop a sort of problem solution match? And you can see here an image um, that is sort of inspired by the work that a number of our colleagues uh, on campus do. Uh, our colleague Hugh Herr lost his limbs in a, um, an accident and has spent much of his career trying to think about and understand new materials that he could potentially use to develop more effective prostheses. Uh, another of our colleagues, Amos Winter, has been thinking about how to actually make uh, prosthetic devices that are much, much less expensive. And so trying to think about tinkering in design space uh, to really completely rethink the physics of the foot, uh, for want of a better description. So they're starting, as many of you are in organizations, with customers who have problems, um, you know, with particular lead users, surgeons in the operating room, um, you know, soldiers fighting on the battlefield, whoever it might be, uh, we're starting in problem space. And then we can kind of explore solution space very, very widely. 
On the other hand, it is quite reasonable to sometimes start in solution space and to say, look, I've generated something that could be a very powerful uh, hammer. Um, I'm looking for a nail. And you could think about general purpose technologies like machine learning, you know, new kinds of materials sometimes do start that way. And so what I, but what I then have to do to make that valuable is I might be starting in solution space, but I then really need to allow myself to explore problem space, to find that sort of elusive problem solution match. And so the answer to, you know, which is best, I think is, it actually doesn't really matter your starting point as, as long as you are very rapidly beginning to try to converge on, on matching problems and solutions, which means bringing diverse people together who understand problems and who understand solutions, getting those communities together, bringing diverse points of view and deeper understanding, not waiting for these um, very inefficient and very ineffective handovers. And so that begins to start to help us understand how we should really be mapping and matching um, in, in across the innovation landscape, which is often a very big problem for our large organizations, is understanding what type of innovation we're really focused on. So Phil, maybe you can uh, help us understand that our innovation landscape uh, yes, and this is very helpful. Several of you in the chat asked about uh, why we didn't have the word new in our definition. And one of the reasons is because of this two by two, the question new and novelty at the heart of innovation, it's really a question of is this truly new to the world or is it just new to you and your organization? Um, some people out there are quite excited by uh, the two letter, uh, the two syllable ac uh, acronyms out there for the AI and 5G. And they may be new to you, but they're 20 year old technologies that in certain laboratories have been studied. So, what we look at here is from your perspective, is it novel? Now, in your business as usual, whether you're private sector, public sector, or mission driven, you're probably matching a current solution to a current problem and hopefully doing well and earning good revenue, possibly profits. And so innovation can go out on various vectors, one of which is to uh, invent a novel solution by moving out on the x-axis, the horizontal one. Um, of course, there's another form of innovation, which is the going due north on the y-axis and discovering that actually there's a, a current solution to be applied to a novel problem. It could be that you've invented a solution to one problem, but actually you can do innovation by taking your solution to another problem. Or equally, you could be out there searching for innovation and find that someone else has solved uh, a problem that is novel to you, but obviously not novel or new to them, and bring that into your own business as usual. So innovation is not just this sort of far out on the horizon both a novel solution and a novel problem. It is a vector from business as usual, which we've tried to capture in the next slide, that having taught this in our corporate innovation courses, uh, a lot of leaders have found useful. So beyond business as usual, you can go out in at least three different vectors for innovation. A lot of people think only of what we call big eye innovation, sort of the 10x transformation stuff, which the venture capitalists love and the sort of brave startups will talk about. And, and that is a form of innovation. It could be out at what people call the frontier or horizon three to use McKinsey language from the turn of the century. But there's also another very honorable form of innovation, which we call little eye innovation, which instead of being, you know, 10x transformation, swinging for the fences in American baseball terms, um, you could actually have little eye innovation where you're trying to make 10% improvements on your business as usual. It's still a form of innovation. It's not incremental Six Sigma, um, you know, basic improvements. It does require innovation methodologies and some of the approaches that we will talk about. But for many large corporations, their core innovation is going to be that 10% improvement on the business as usual, whether it's 10% on the cost of customer acquisition, 10% improvement with internal processes or speed to market. And for many large organizations, that's also a good place to start. They may have a few bets or a few partners who are way out at the frontier who are looking at that big eye innovation. Um, but there's an awful lot of honorable uh, little eye innovation that's taking place there. So Fiona, having introduced this, this matrix, which is very much our co-creation, is there something else you'd like to say about this before we shift from innovation to ecosystems? No, I, I think the most important thing to think about here is to understand where any given project lies and to recognize that in different parts of that landscape may require different sorts of management approaches, uh, different 
um, types of diversity on your team. Um, and that in fact, most large organizations will have a portfolio where you're really mapping the entirety of what you're doing across um, this landscape. And actually having visibility into that portfolio is a very important leadership task, as is the ability to um, kill projects, but also to manage them differently and to recognize that how you manage little eye innovation projects and how you manage and lead big eye innovation projects can will be distinctive, but actually has some commonalities. And so just recognize that in your organization, just beginning to do this mapping can be a powerful thing to do. Now, we also know that many large organizations traditionally um, felt that the right way to do innovation was to basically do all their innovation across that entire landscape internally and to build an internally focused innovation system that would somehow deliver the entirety of the innovation portfolio against their strategy and their strategic goals. They often built uh, large facilities, as you can see some of them pictured here, um, in the middle of, of large fields, uh, typically quite far away from people so that the, um, the sort of genius inventor who was meant to do this could actually sit undisturbed. Or they could sit, as you can see in some of the other images, in an ivory tower and, and, and have kind of great thoughts that would drive that that innovation portfolio. I think we know that that doesn't really deliver and that most organizations have to look as much externally as internally to actually fulfill the entirety of their innovation portfolio. And it's really with that that much of our work is, is sort of focused, is on that external engagement. So Phil, I think we should shift to our discussion of stakeholders. Does that sound right to you? Yes, can I just say one word on this slide? Um, this is a very sort of 20th century concept that innovation and great ideas would come from people sitting in a field, whether it was Bell Labs or Cambridge. And what we've seen since the turn of the century is really the acceleration of the process that it's happening in what Fiona has called these innovation ecosystems. So we've been studying these for the last couple of decades. And as we share this concept, this, is, this ecosystem logic is why we think this is going to continue to matter even as we move into the post-COVID world. Now, as we dig down into what's going on in these ecosystems, um, we end up with a stakeholder model, which is in the next slide. And what I love about this particular uh, MIT uh, model is there are five stakeholders at the table. And because it's a round table, a bit like King Arthur, nobody's actually at the head of the table, although, although we put the entrepreneur at the top of our, our graphic because they are very important to innovation-driven entrepreneurial ecosystems. Um, so... Two key things here. One, there's five stakeholders, not the usual three of the so-called triple helix, uh, which is uh, very popular at the moment in, in some circles still. Triple helix basically says that all you need is the university, the government, and the corporate, and those three large organizations will create innovation. Uh, it's a great theory. Uh, in practice, that's not really what's happening. And so our update on the triple helix, as in the uh, working paper mentioned at the bottom of the slide, is to add two key players. Because in the innovation ecosystems that are working best, you also have the role of the entrepreneurs. They're represented uh, by an entrepreneur leader and her startup team. This is very rarely the heroic individual and certainly not just the boys. Um, and then on the risk capital side, there's a variety of forms of risk capital. It's not just venture capital. Uh, in many parts of the world, I know as a diplomat that you're not just going to get Silicon Valley style venture capital uh, occurring naturally. But risk capital is a spectrum that goes from high net worth individuals, entrepreneurs who've exited and can be angel investors uh, through angel syndicates, then that narrow slice of, of VC, but onto corporate VC, uh, university grants and other funds. And so adding these five players is really important. And at the end of the day, nobody's in charge of innovation-driven entrepreneurship. All five of these stakeholders come together, and we teach this in a global program called uh, REAP that I'll, I'll put in chat in a, in a moment, of which one of the core players is, is the corporate. Um, so we're double clipping on that today because it's really important that you have all five players there. And the corporates both have a role to play in the ecosystem, that's what we cover in REAP, but also the corporates can draw innovation benefit from understanding this ecosystem logic and getting to work with the other four players with the ecosystem, um, particularly the entrepreneurs. Uh, and that is where Fiona has come up with a spectrum of entrepreneurs. So you think clearly about the kinds of startup entrepreneurs you want to be working with. So Fiona, may I turn over to you for your array of beasts uh, that are entrepreneurial startups? Absolutely. And so just with that, I'm going to ask people to hold that thought for a moment. Um, 
And I just want to make one ecosystem point, particularly around COVID, which is as we think about the um, development of COVID vaccines uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, it's really interesting to think about the role that innovation ecosystems have played in that. And so if you think about Moderna, for example, so you would think about Moderna uh, developing their vaccine as represented in, as um, an entrepreneurial team uh, started you know, back in 2012. Uh, Risk Capital uh, started in Boston or in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Risk Capital, the initial Risk Capital coming from a flagship pioneering. Um, the role of the government, DARPA funding, went into the company along with lots of other funding sources. The role of a number of universities really working on the foundational mRNA ideas and the role of corporations, including Lonza, um, who've been very important in the production. So you can actually see that at least some of those key players, highly, highly co-located in this case in Cambridge, Massachusetts, likewise BioNTech and their work with Pfizer, you know, quite densely co-located in uh, Germany until you start to access global supply chains. And so we see these innovation ecosystems being really important to innovations that actually have mattered to us uh, throughout the pandemic. And so just recognizing that this is um, not just a conceptual thing, but something that actually has really made a difference. As Bill said, it's quite important as if you're in a large corporation um, or any other large organization, public or private sector, as you start to think about how the ecosystem can help deliver on your innovation portfolio, you need to be really clear about the type of enterprise, the type of entrepreneurs you might want to engage with. Uh, we've often made a, tried to make a distinction that not all um, startup enterprises are made equal. And we've begun to think about this in terms of a continuum. And so some work that Phil and I have done recently um, with our student Obogu Ukuku um, has really taken us from understanding um, a distinction of SMEs, all the small and medium-sized enterprises on the one hand, to what we've coined and in work I did um, about 10 years ago with Bill Alette from MIT is innovation driven enterprises to actually saying that there's a spectrum. So at one end of the spectrum, we're going to have the SMEs that some have dubbed camels, which basically because they live for often quite a long time and can actually go on very few resources um, and sort of be quite resilient in our economy in some ways, through to digitally enabled SMEs, who are the ones who have potential to become sort of gazelles and do some sort of growth, through to the IDEs, these innovation driven enterprises which is where we know a lot of new job creation is. Those are the enterprises that tend to be out towards that frontier, uh, towards the 10x innovation that Phil and I uh, spoke about in our innovation landscape. We then wanted to break down that distinction and really make a distinction between the digitally focused, the sort of 10x IDEs, those that might potentially turn into unicorns, and really identify that there's another type of IDE, and we wanted to give it another animal, so I christened them dolphins, deep tech dolphins. These are ones that often will be coming out of laboratories, from university laboratories, from national labs, um, you know, sometimes spinning out from corporate research laboratories. They're deep tech, they're doing something that is often very tough tech, often very physical, very capital intensive. And they're deep tech also in the sense that, you know, they actually have a very significant value of death in terms of the amount of capital that they need. But they also have transformative uh, potential. And so you might think of many of the life science companies, the mRNA vaccine companies as fitting into that category, uh, nuclear fusion companies like Commonwealth Fusion Systems, uh, companies focused on quantum computing startups um, would be in that category. So as a corporate, you're going to want to think about where you can find those digitally focused IDEs as well as the deep tech IDEs. And really the question that we've been asking ourselves is to what extent are these enterprises still likely to be highly located and co-located in innovation ecosystems? So perhaps, Phil, I can ask you to take us through, as the diplomat, some of the geography of where these innovation-driven enterprises tend to co-locate. Definitely. And uh, Fiona, you're getting some uh, nice uh, love online here for mentioning um, SMEs. Uh, most of our economies are made of SMEs, and so they're on a spectrum, and it's important not to forget them. But yes, the interesting thing with this innovation ecosystem is innovation, like markets and capitalism, is not inherently fair. Um, and not evenly distributed across the planet. And so what we have seen is there are certain innovation ecosystems that have been attracting uh, the attention. So as you'll see on the right there, we've got London, Singapore, uh, Shenzhen, Tel Aviv. We've also got a variety of locations in the United Kingdom. Because one of the things we were seeing even before the pandemic 
is that the ecosystems were getting things right, pulling the five stakeholders together, thinking about SMEs through IDEs and caring about them all in terms of innovation, were actually doing rather well. Um, and so innovation was going to places that were not just the traditional hubs, not just London in England, our hometown, uh, but also Manchester, Birmingham, uh, parts of Scotland. It's amazing, and Belfast, it's amazing where these things are happening. And one of the things we'll come to now as we reach the halfway point is how has COVID changed innovation and ecosystems? And what we think is, though the streets look a little quiet, and I believe, Fiona, that's the view from your office. How is it looking now? Well, I can tell you, and those of you who know uh, my office and know this area, that, that there's considerably more traffic on the Longfellow Bridge. This was a photograph taken right at the beginning of lockdown. And it really did beg this question, you know, is there still a role for our vibrant innovation ecosystems? Or in fact, have we really seen, you know, finally uh, the death of distance and, you know, geography no longer matters and the world being flat um, or at least somewhat empty? Um, and I think that is the question that has been animating us for the last year. And so that's the interesting thing now that we want to come to in our chat. We've given you the perspectives of innovation and how it's been working these last 20, 30 years, why it matters to corporates. Um, we've been looking at this ecosystem logic, which up to the eve of the pandemic was uh, starting to concentrate in certain places. And as Fiona has said, the innovation ecosystem logic turned out to be quite useful in the pandemic in the sense that some of these innovation ecosystems produced um, vaccines. Now, you, you can't have enough, um, you know, dancing apps, you know, good old TikTok. Um, but actually, it's quite useful in a uh, COVID crisis to have vaccines. And they've come out of ecosystems like Kendall Square, Oxford, um, based around startup entrepreneurs. So the question is, this is what Fiona and I are now going to chat about. And we'd love to see your views in the chat as well, is corporate innovation in a post-COVID world. So Fiona, you're the professor. Maybe I can put the first question to you. Do you think this innovation ecosystem logic is going to hold? You know, some people talk bravely about the death of distance, the end of geography. Nobody wants to go back to their offices. Um, focusing on innovation ecosystems, do you think the ecosystem logic will hold? Uh, so I do. Um, I think it's going to hold, although I think it will hold in a slightly different way. Uh, you know, we see people having particularly young people, if you sit on a university campus, you know the extraordinary desire of young people to co-locate again. Where we see the desire of, of, of talented individuals to want to be alongside one another. Um, they want those kind of serendipitous connections. And so I think for individuals, for humans, the desire to co-locate, particularly when we want to um, be creative and have inspiration at the early stages of the innovation process. I think we are still, we are going to see that co-location really does matter. And you see that when we notice that if you look around and ask who is coming back to work or where has actually tried never, not to shut down, we know that university labs have remained basically open in part because of just the physical necessity of being in the lab with the test tubes and the beakers and what have you. Um, but also that sort of real desire to come back. So we've seen startup accelerators, co-working spaces be among the first to come back to life. So that would be the first piece of the puzzle, I would say. that We know that at the early stages of the innovation process and that idea to impact journey, at those very early stages, we need diverse talent and different people. We need serendipitous connections. We need this ability to search problem and solution space. A lot of big organizations, a lot of corporations have really relied on their existing social networks and that existing social fabric to sustain them through the COVID crisis and through having to work from home in new and different ways. The problem with that is that those existing, that existing social fabric at some point doesn't admit new diverse individuals because we've had to do it online. It's highly organized and orchestrated. And so where we want to replenish and have more inclusion, more diversity of talent, in some ways, co-location is actually essential. And so I, those, I think, are some of the trends which are going to shift us towards seeing innovation ecosystems coming back to life. But I'm not sure that's the only thing that's happening. So perhaps, Phil, I mean, what, what are you seeing? I'm really curious whether that accords with your point of view. Well, I think it's a really good question. And I'm struck that every 10 years or so, there are some exciting books out there. So just after the year 2000, uh, we were told the world is flat. In terms of innovation, it didn't turn out to be flat. It still was pretty spiky with ecosystems. 
And, and then we had, you know, the death of distance. We'd already had the end of history, of course. Um, and so it's really interesting that despite these challenges every 10 years, there are some certain human elements to what's going on. And um, so I think there's, a, there's an ongoing logic of continuity, but also there are things have changed. You know, a lot of companies we've worked with through our corporate innovation work have done more in their digital transformation in the last five months uh, than they did in the five years that they had planned. So it certainly accelerated some digital work. The fact that we were doing this all together on LinkedIn Live, and many of us have got used to uh, this and Teams and Zoom and Cisco WebEx and all kinds of things. Um, but I'm really struck um, how many people want to be coming back. Our students want to come back. Our executives want to come and take these courses in person. And I think that's because there's a human element, particularly at certain moments in the innovation process, particularly at the early stage creatives. Um, that people want to get together. I think the other thing that's happening is a distribution. And I, I want to make sure that we come back to the diversity and inclusion sides, because I think in line with some of your other work, we have a real opportunity at the start of this decade to think about the inclusivity of our innovation ecosystems. But what I would say is I think there's also a distribution element. I don't think this innovation-driven entrepreneurship is going to be evenly spread across every square mile of the country, you know, in every prairie, in every sand dune. But I think there is now a shift away from some of the big cities, just like Silicon Valley, San Francisco, or just London. I think things are going to be slightly more distributed. And there's actually an opportunity for other places to pick up some of this globally mobile distributed talent who could actually work in cities in the American heartland or up north in England or in various parts of you know, Latin America and elsewhere. So I think we're at a really interesting moment and I think that drives our desire. So can I, what do you think about that distribution point? Uh, is this an opportunity? And then can we come back to that diversity and inclusion? Because I think we need to be conscious about these things. Yeah. So I definitely think you're right. And, and actually, the vaccine, I want to come back. There have been a few really interesting comments in the chat that have reminded me that even though I tell the vaccine story from a rather parochial Boston, uh, Cambridge uh, point of view, because I know the, ex uh, the Moderna example and Nubara Fayan well, um, as you, Phil, mentioned, there were very important contributions made out of um, Oxford uh, in Germany, but also, as mentioned in the chat, um, Hyderabad and Genome Valley in India. Um, and so we really have seen, you know, a sort of a ecosystems at various points around the globe being incredibly important in making that contribution. Um, and so that first tells us that this is no longer a phenomenon that is just Silicon Valley and potentially Greater Boston as the sort of number two. Um, it really has become, ecosystems have become a global phenomenon. I think that your point about scale is really important. So certainly around hardware, we do know that around this deep tech phenomena, the deep tech dolphins, um, we're still going to see this really big need for co-location economies of scale and scope, potentially in new places, potentially around you know national labs, around you know big more government-oriented public research enterprises and so on. But I think there's an interesting question about the digital. And a number of you have commented really interestingly in the chat that you thought everything was going to go virtual. And then I think, was it Sean, you mentioned something about being hybrid and what's happening in Miami, that all of a sudden what we thought was everyone just going to stay home and code just isn't the case. Humans, many humans, most of us want to be around other people. And there's very little substitute for some of that human connectivity and creativity. And so I think, Phil, you're spot on to say that we're going to see more, a sort of a wider distribution of ecosystems. I think that post-COVID, we will see that smaller scale ecosystems are going to be able to survive and be very, very vibrant and viable. And in fact, they may be more vibrant because people don't want to go back into the gigantic mm -hmm. ecosystems of the past. And so we are going to see sort of middle tier locations, cities that are not quite so big, um, really support particular places, whether that's Manchester in the UK. Um, so I say Miami was also mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, Marcio, you talked about this hybrid version. I think there's really something in this idea of being hybrid, hybrid in person and geographically distributed local and yet connected into global supply chains, um, you know, digital and physical. And there's going to be these interesting hybrids emerging that I just don't think we've seen before. No, I, I think that's spot on. And I actually take this as a message of hope. You know, there had been some element before the pandemic where we've been working with regions, trying to work out how they could be better as innovation ecosystems. And I think the, the flux and disruption that's come from the pandemic gives us a chance to do things differently. 
And so there's, I think there's a chance for other cities to be involved, other locations. Um, and uh, a good friend, Amir, threw in there, yeah, the idea of this like inter-ecosystem networks. Yeah, I think I, it's going to be, the, I think it's going to be the ecosystems. Did you see that one as well? I thought it was really clever. Yeah, um, I did. The, mm -hmm. I, I hope we're recording all the chat because I can barely keep up with all of this. And I look forward to reviewing it afterwards. Um, but I think, yes, there, the ecosystems that do well um, are also going to network with the other ecosystems, you know, Boston to London, uh, San Francisco to Shenzhen. Um, and I think one of the challenges, it's great that these hotbed innovation ecosystems are connected. Um, but I also want to make sure that we don't forget the areas around those innovation ecosystems. Because one of the things that struck me, and I'd love to get your views, Fiona, is that a decade ago when you know people were talking about the end of capitalism with the financial crisis, uh, capitalism came back, um, innovation came back, but in ways that I think left people and places behind during the 2010s decade. And I think we've seen this in some of the populist politics. We've seen this in some of the social unrest. And I think we've also seen this in health outcomes, even before the pandemic, with opioid crises and other deaths of despair. So given that a decade ago, our rebuilding, I don't think we anywhere did brilliantly. How should we be thinking about making the innovation economy more inclusive in this coming decade and more respectful of diversity, which I believe from your work matters to this creative mm -hmm. process? Absolutely. So I think that there's an enormous amount of evidence that regardless of where your point of view um, on why we need to have more diversity, that actually diversity is a very powerful driver of innovation and leads to significantly better innovation and innovative outcomes. And so the real question is, how do we do that? How do we create environments where diversity of perspectives, of backgrounds, of lived experiences can really be brought to bear? And so I like to think about this as us trying to build more consciously inclusive innovation ecosystems. That's quite a lot of words, but you know, conscious inclusion is important. This does not happen naturally. Um, we typically find that individuals, you know, will connect to people who are very much like them on whatever dimension. Um, you know, the old adage that birds of a feather flock together. Uh, and so we actually have to be quite consciously inclusive, and we want our ecosystems to be that way. So I think that there are a few things. So this hybrid idea suggests that we have the ability to draw people in from different parts of the world um, and from different backgrounds and different places. And so while we want to think about having access to global talent, I think we mustn't forget local talent. That sometimes we can be sitting in these tremendously uh, powerful and important innovation ecosystems, and yet only a few few blocks away there may be communities who don't feel included. And so we have to work out how to open our doors to those individuals, how to make sure that we have programs to connect, how we listen to what the community, the ideas that are coming from the community, not just go out there and tell people what to do. Um, so I think that there's a lot of conscious inclusion work, but that can be framed around shared problems and challenges. Uh, so that's one thing I would pick up on. And in the chat, somebody mentioned, you know, we ran some global hackathons um, as COVID began when we were completely virtual. And that gave us lots of ideas about how we can use different forms of mechanisms to connect. But as we come back, we want to be, make sure that we are as inclusive locally. Um, I think that there's some other quite positive changes. So as we look at risk capital, risk capital providers have often only really invested in companies that were very proximate to them. People always laugh that venture capitalists didn't like to drive more than 10 minutes to <laughs> investments. And we are seeing change. And we are seeing a willingness of risk capital to invest in teams of people that they've never actually met in person. And to, so to invest at a little bit more of a distance. Again, I think that's going to drive us towards having smaller ecosystems be just as uh, vibrant. Mm -hmm. But there's a real um, emphasis, I think, and there needs to be an emphasis that risk capital providers and their limited partners, you know, the endowments and sovereign wealth funds and pension funds have to say, and you need to take this inclusion seriously. You know, we want to look and understand your numbers. You have to be willing to open up those social networks to people who are different from you and different than the people you've always invested in before. And so that is the conscious part of uh, building these inclusive innovation ecosystems. That's excellent. Thank, thank you for saying that, Fiona. And thank you for your research and profiling on some of the inequities. We need diversity 
for the creative early phases of innovation. All the ecosystem stakeholders need that for their ecosystems to be successful. And corporates have a role to play in this. So in a moment, I was going to invite uh, Peter Hurst to come back in and perhaps pluck out some of the questions from chat or Q&A that we might not have seen. Um, and just to let people know, in the last five minutes or so before the top of the hour, uh, given all the questions people have had about how they can learn more, and we have only started to scratch the surface of the issues here. So we want to give you some opportunities to see the ways to follow on, whether you're interested in the whole ecosystem or particularly the corporate perspective. Um, but with that, I see Peter Hurst has joined us. So, Peter, what have you been making of the Q&A? And is there anything you'd like to uh, throw out to uh, mostly to Fiona? <laughs> sure. Thank, thank you, Phil and Fiona. It's been just enormous uh, feedback and uh, questions and comments. You've seen many of them. One observation for me is that uh, you know, the improvements in technology, but also uh, as, as all of you have got so much better at using it, maybe it's making the role of moderator a little bit redundant as well. You've been doing a great job of tracking that and answering many of the questions and, and, and even answer, answering comments I've seen as you've gone along, Phil. So uh, that, that, that's great to see. And I think it's an illustration of how much you know, technology is changing uh, the, you know, the ways that we work and as we're getting used to it. Uh, we're, we're being effective in, in, in different ways. There was one flavor of questions. I won't attribute it to any one person, but putting them sort of together uh, based on everything that you've been saying, really. And I think it's in the realm of big eye innovation. Uh, and, and it has to do with uh, the question of how do we stay ahead of uh, and, and innovate faster than the great challenges that uh, we're being presented with. In the pandemic, Fiona, you you talked about sort of vaccines, uh, for example. But what are the things that haven't been working, that we're not doing, uh, that we need to think differently about uh, in order to be able to get ahead and stay ahead of some of the great challenges, whether it's future pandemics, climate change, and so forth? Is there something that, as you in your work, looked at these uh, kinds of questions that you think we need to be doing differently? That's a good question, Peter. Phil, shall I take a stab at that and then let you yeah, say that's something? That's a really difficult one. Thank you, Peter. Over to you, Professor. <laughs> so look, I think that one of the reasons why during COVID there was this sort of great flourishing of ideas of, um, you know, the, the sort of galvanizing of these major ecosystems around the world was in part because it was a very focused challenge. Like we had a very specific challenge, which was, you know, how do we overcome this you know, terrible virus? Um, and, and really a, a focus on a vaccine as being an extraordinarily important part of the solution. Once, when you lay out a very, very clear and quite time-bounded challenge, it's much easier for organizations and I think communities and individuals to rally to that. And so I think that is one of the many reasons why we've ended up with, you know, a whole set of, of vaccines. We've seen that the less well articulated problem, the one that people somehow didn't quite remember that they had to solve, which was the global supply chain and distribution was less well solved. In part, I think, because it wasn't rendered so clear, we didn't really think about it. In terms of the other big global challenges, and, and especially, you know, with the G7 happening and COP26, you know, climate change is obviously extraordinary and important. I think we're beginning to start to push our big eye innovation out towards that, but we have to make it um, a priority. And we probably have to break it down into a series of quite clearly articulated missions and then challenges. Because I think human communities and these ecosystems will work better and tend to work better when they have a little bit more focus. Um, the same is true in security and defense. Um, so across this range of challenges, I think it's when there are complicated things. So if you think about global health inequity, for example, that's an enormous challenge, but because it requires massive system change, that's much more difficult because you actually need a whole set of small interventions simultaneously. That's much more difficult, I think. And so that's where our big organizations and our ecosystems have to come together, I think, in new ways that I'm not sure we've yet worked out how best to do that. I think those are great answers on the great global missions. And I would just sort of take um, a, a perspective. I think this moment of opportunity as we think about the missions, and it's been amazing how all five stakeholders and ecosystems have rallied to this COVID pandemic. Um, there are other sort of issues as well. I think the global distribution of economic opportunity. I think through this innovation challenge of the 2020s, um, you know, there are opportunities. You know, Google has chosen Ghana 
to, to work in. There are places in Latin America that are making themselves very innovative. And so we need to think beyond a sort of 20th century mindset about who's good at innovation and realize that there's a real opportunity for places around the world to harness this and network their innovation ecosystems with, with others as well as doing the other thing, which is, and people are talking about this, go global, but also think local. How do you tie your innovation ecosystem into the hinterland? MIT and Kendall Square, how do we connect with Cambridge Port or uh, Nubian Square in, in Roxbury? So how do we connect globally, but how do we also make sure that this innovation effort helps locally? I think those are very important missions that will, will all galvanize people. That's great. That's very helpful. Clearly, there's a, there's a lot of uh, work that uh, you're all still doing, trying to understand uh, and, and contribute to that. You know, there, there was also, I think, a lot of support uh, in the uh, comments uh, when you were talking at the other end uh, from the guy uh, about sort of the role of, of SMEs. And Phil, I think when you were talking about you know, what are the communities that surround the, the, the hot, hotbeds of big eye innovation uh, and the interfaces between them. Uh, and also, uh, at the same time, uh, a lot of interest in your idea about hybrid uh, um, sort of ecosystems that, that might uh, develop where perhaps you don't have all five elements uh, in your local geography, but you can, uh, using uh, technology, perhaps be able to, digital technology, digitalization, be able to sort of connect with uh, some of those other pieces that maybe are not so strongly present in, in your uh, geography. In your mm -hmm. geography. Uh, so, uh, trying to put again some of the comments around all of that together, it, it seemed like that there was a thread saying, "Look, technology increasingly is going to make humanity more 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 necessary and more important because perhaps AI and other forms of technology will be doing a lot of the work that has been bringing us together as you know, in, in the past." Uh, and, and so, uh, I think there's a there's a real fascination for the question. You did address it, uh, um, but maybe you could dive dive a bit deeper into it uh, of you know, will digital really uh, create new forms of ecosystems? Uh, and might that be part of the solution for how you do engage what you were asking about, you know, sort of the broader um, places that are not uh, geographically co-located with these uh, deep wells of, of, of innovation capability? Shall I take a first swing? Yeah, please do. Uh, so I think the digital technologies are amazing. And the fact that we have so many people here available from so many places in the world able to tap in to take exec ed courses and stuff, I think it's a great enabler for those who have the technology and the broadband uh, bandwidth to be able to do so. Lots of people are not included. And so we need to think about who has the privilege to be at these particular tables. I think digital is a great augmenter. Um, I think it will allow certain things to happen. We have in the crisis done an awful lot. We, as Fiona mentioned, uh, she and her MIT Innovation Initiative has done some wonderful uh, virtual hackathons. And yet the human yearning to come together is really strong. We've done a lot of work uh, in, in the Middle East. And it's amazing there where you know technology in some of the Gulf countries really allows connectivity. And yet there's still a desire at certain moments to be together for in person. And so I think that's going to be the challenge for corporate leaders and ecosystem leaders. At what moments in the innovation process, and remember Fiona's definition, it's a process. At what moments do you need to be together in person? Maybe team building, creativity, hacking. And then you can go off and do the coding and the primary customer research separately. But I think thinking through when do you need to be in person? So Fiona, that's my, that's my attempt at an answer. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm slightly distracted because I'm reading the chat and that's given me all these ideas. But let me just, I, I, I think that this idea, so in previous recoveries, we really have either relied on consciously or discovered that it is these innovation-driven enterprises that have actually driven job growth. And then there have been these spillover effects to SMEs. I think what we are going to see this time around and what we've already seen in the pandemic is that... Um, we need to be really conscious about using all that digital enablement to make sure that SMEs grow in their productivity. Um, and that economies that have often been sort of based on having enormous numbers of SMEs are also trying to think about building those innovation-driven enterprises. And I was really um, reflecting, Phil, you'd, you'd raised the example of Ghana and Accra and some of the work that we've done there. Um, I was also sort of reflecting on our work and 
talking to our team from Cairo yesterday mm. on the fact that some of the unicorns that have come out of 2010, you know, post post economic crisis, so companies like Karim and others um, that are really sort of taking an economy and shifting it significantly towards moving those those opportunities up to be more innovation driven enterprises. Um, and I think what we're going to see there, Peter, so those feel like things that are happening interestingly at a local level and yet connecting in to quite global markets. And so there's, you know, a drawing in of local talent and actually a sort of an upgrading of that talent, thinking about both shifting innovation down into the SMEs and really upping the um, experiences, the ambition, you know, the, the access to markets of those SMEs to, to become IDEs. But then recognizing that those things can then have global impact. And I think that this local global tension, which also is around how much do we want our supply chains to be local because they are more resilient versus global because they're potentially more efficient, is a really challenging one. Um, but the human dimension to all that is something that our colleagues in the future of work have been thinking a lot about. Um, but absolutely, the, the innovation piece of this seems to me to be sort of central, um, the central role of, of kind of individuals. But that makes education, digital access, you know, Internet access and all that so much more important than it already has been. No, I, I think that's spot on. And I see we've got about five more minutes. So, Peter, I don't know if there's a final question or whether we should turn to our final slides where, because we can't answer everything today, where we want to give people opportunities to see other ways with, with which they can connect. That, that was uh, very appreciative, Phil. That was going to be my final question, which uh, was to observe that with all this technology, we're still slaves to time. Uh, <laughs> and we're almost out of our allotment of it for this fascinating conversation. So first of all, you know, thank you both for this uh, incredible uh, discussion that you've been having uh, and everyone who's been uh, adding their thoughts and questions in uh, in the chat uh, as well. Uh, this is a great example of the kind of discussion and debate that we need to have. Uh, and there were many people who uh, were looking for ways to uh, get involved and learn more about your work, Paul and Fiona. So perhaps uh, if you have one more slide that helped that, where you could talk about ways that people can uh, get more involved and learn more, uh, that would be a fitting way to, to close this particular discussion today. Excellent. Thank you, Peter. Do, do we have such a slide, Fiona? So here, here's a slide with summaries, and I'm going to ask Fiona to speak to it, but I wondered if I could just call to everybody who's out there. Um, I've been thinking that we should probably write something up, either in an article or a book on all of this, and I'm trying to persuade people. So as Fiona goes through these ideas captured on a PowerPoint, if you could give us a sense of whether there's interest in these sorts of subjects, either with a with a heart or a light bulb or something, while Fiona's speaking through this, that will give us a sense of whether we should be uh, trying to take time to write some of this up. So, Fiona, would you take us through these five key conclusions? Yeah, just a few things. I mean, perhaps the most obvious ecosystems, places will still matter, especially I think we agreed on the earlier stages of innovation where that sense of serendipity, unexpected interactions, diverse insights will be at a premium. That co-location between those with sort of the problem owners, those driving, focusing us on missions and entrepreneurs and others with novel solutions, um, still co-location essential. Deep tech, those deep tech dolphins certainly need large scale infrastructure, test beds are gonna really remain the heart of some ecosystems. But even for digital innovation, I think it's very clear that talented individuals want to co-locate. But what's very interesting, I think, is that we have the opportunity for those to be a little more globally distributed, not just a small handful of mega ecosystems, but more smaller scale ecosystems where people want to live and have their creative being. Um, um, and that we will definitely see these being hybrid, so hybrid, physical, and you know, virtual. Uh, we will see these networks of ecosystems and how important it is to think about being consciously inclusive in the way we build our innovation ecosystems. For large corporations, what does that mean? It means there's a lot going on. You need to be really strategic about your ecosystem engagement more so than ever, particularly because I think that in face-to-face -face interaction is going to remain at a premium um, and it's going to be a scarce resource that we have to think about differently. So that is something that we need to talk about, I think, as a community together further. Um, but with that, there'll be, there are lots of other opportunities to talk and engage with us. So I think, Phil, do you want to share a few of those and just let me know how to, when to click through? Sure. Well, first of all, lots of hearts and support there for Fiona for us to write this up and do more exec ed. So first thing, 
Uh, we've got new dates for our standard two day where the Phil and Fiona show will be live online uh, on the 15th and 16th of July. We've just added those new dates to squeeze one in before the summer because we think this is so uh, important. So there's the link to the ecosystem one. On the next slide, uh, for those who don't want to do it live, we have, thanks to Peter Hurst, a recorded version uh, where you do it six, uh, six weeks, uh, self-paced, so great if you're in different time frames. Um, and that's there on corporate innovation, uh, very similar material. And you, uh, you, the registration is open now for the August the 18th, uh, six week period. Um, on the next slide, we also sometimes dig deep into particular sectors. So this is uh, my taking a lead on doing something with the insurance industry. So uh, insurance is a key aspect to so much of the innovation economy, uh, including uh, managing cyber risk. So thanks to ExecEd and our partners at Insure, uh, we are rolling out um, some half days starting next week. Uh, registration is open. I believe uh, there is also a discount that we can make available. This will result for those who do all four half days. There will be uh, an MIT certificate at the very end with our deep dive. Uh, elsewhere, other aspects, given what I've seen in the chat, I teach with Hal Gregerson, who literally wrote the book. He and I co-teach something about innovators' DNA. So instead of looking at the ecosystem, we look at individuals and teams in a complementary way, uh, how to be more innovative. And we've just uploaded dates at uh, the end of September for the next version of DNA. Uh, but we have no monopoly on this. Fiona, what are you doing over at the Innovation Initiative? Uh, so over at the Innovation Initiative, we have a corporate innovation program where we're leading a, a small group of companies through just really connect, helping build out their innovation strategy by connecting into the wider uh, MIT uh, innovation activities. So happy to welcome discussion about that. And I think with that, at almost exactly the top of the hour, you know, perhaps questions is the wrong thing, but continue to have our con <laughs> have conversation with us. We're really happy to welcome further interactions and discussion. Uh, this is obviously an extraordinarily important topic. So please stay in touch uh, with us on LinkedIn or in other ways. Thank you. And I saw a question there for a masterclass, Fiona. So we should review the, uh, the, the chat and see what can be done. Uh, with that, over to you, Peter. Great, thank you again, uh, Phil and Fiona, and lots uh, of ways there for people who uh, want to keep exploring uh, with you and with MIT and learning uh, and advancing uh, this field and uh, having an impact, going from the idea to impact, which is core to everything that we that we do. So we're all about that. Thank you uh, for sharing that uh, this, this idea and this framework uh, with us. Thank you again all for joining us. As uh, you, I think, saw in the chat, we will be uh, sharing a recording uh, of this uh, event as well, because uh, there were a lot of ideas that as Phil and Fiona noted, not only in the chat, but you know, in all of the discussion, uh, did, did sort of fly by quite quickly. And I think if you want to go back and review those or even better share them with your colleagues uh, and friends and family uh, and widen this conversation even further, uh, that would be another way I think to contribute to, to this body of work. Uh, so thank you all for being with us. Thank you, Phil and Fiona for a fascinating conversation. Thank you for everything that you do uh, with us uh, and at MIT uh, in this very important uh, field, uh, which uh, returning to the uh, pandemic and COVID theme, uh, clearly, uh, I think we all agree that the science and the innovation uh, at every scale uh, clearly is needed uh, by us uh, around the world in all of our societies. Uh, and this is a great example uh, to all of us, I think, of uh, the kind of collaboration globally uh, that we must have going forward. Uh, so thank you all for being part of this. Um, we'll look forward to uh, seeing many of you again and we look forward to Fiona to seeing you having a bit on campus uh, in the very near future. Sounds good. Thank, thank you, Peter. Thank you.